Now, moving on, our final speaker for the evening is somebody who I remember seeing <laughs> quite, quite early on in, in, in my work. And I remember watching her. I was sitting on the floor, actually, because the, the hall she was speaking in was so packed that there wasn't any seats available. And I was literally on the floor, right by her feet, looking up like this, and thinking at the time, Ya Rab, make her a Muslim, because she's just saying stuff that most of our Muslim men will never say as long, even if Allah gave them 10 lifetimes, they would never have the courage to say this stuff. Most of you know her. Sister Yvonne Ridley is an inspiration to us all. I ask her to please come up. Zakumullah khair. Well, your prayers were most um, awesome. <laughs> Brothers, sisters, salam alaikum. If I asked you what springs to mind, if I said, uh, what do you think about when I say 1966? I bet there are so many of you in here who will go, yes, that was the year that England won the World Cup. But after tonight, when someone asks, what does 1966 mean to you? I'm hoping that you will give a different response. Because 1966 was the year that an extraordinary Egyptian woman appeared in court with several others and she was sentenced to hard labor for life. The court was in Cairo and had she been alive today, Zainab al-Ghazali, a pioneer for Islamist feminism, would despair that little or nothing has changed in Egypt today. Her crime, funnily enough, her crime back then would probably be enough to get her locked up in Egypt today. Her crime was that she was a leading light in the Muslim Brotherhood, and she had founded the female wing of the Ikhwan. As I say, that would be enough just to get her locked up in Sisi's Egypt today, and it was certainly enough in Nasser's time as well. But what makes her story even more significant is what she was forced to endure during those years in Nasser's dungeons and how she continued her amazing resistance to her abusers. And that resistance was nothing more than holding on tight to the rope of Allah as she awaited those torture sessions, and they were daily occurrences during the seven years that she was held. As she awaited those daily torture sessions, she would recite verses from the Holy Quran. Even after her conviction, her abusers were determined to force some sort of false confession out of her. So as I say, the torture didn't stop after she was given a life sentence. The torture continued on every single day. She was accused of trying to conspire to assassinate President Gamal Abd al Nasser, charges which she always denied. And while other members of the Brotherhood cracked under pressure, every foul deed done to Zainab made her stronger and more resolute. I was given this book about her life called Return of the Pharaoh. It was one of the first books that I read after I had read about, after I had read the Holy Quran. And I went into a bookshop in Birmingham, which is well known to most of us here. And I said, I want to find out about Muslims, especially Muslim women. Have you got anything you can give me? And I was given this book. It's going to be auctioned tonight. You can't, it's out of print now. So um, it's, it really is an amazing book. And it brought tears 
to my eyes as I was going through the pages, tears of revulsion, wondering how one human being could abuse another with such brutality. But it also brought tears of admiration as I wondered how and where did this woman get her strength, get her resistance from? Imagine waking up every day to know you are going to be tortured. But you just have to look back at her life to see from where she got her strength, and it's from the family. There is a great saying that behind every um, great man, there is a woman. Well, behind this great woman was a father who was determined that his daughter would be educated, would go out and seek knowledge, would be strong, would be a great ambassador for Islam. And she was. She was born in 1917 into a religious household. And she is still talked with great affection today. She was a leader, a leader who embraced Islam and all that it stands for. How many fathers would invest so much time with their daughters back then? So it's no exaggeration to say this woman uh, was a huge influence. She did influence millions of Muslims around the world, encouraging them to return, to rediscover the beauty of Islam. No wonder Nasser saw her as such a threat. She never plotted to kill him, but he plotted to kill her. In February 1964, he sent his secret agents to create a car accident in which she very nearly died. But alhamdulillah, she survived. It would be one of very, one of many tests and challenges that she would face. After this attempted assassination, she was then uh, chosen for bribery, blackmail. At every opportunity they could, the regime in Egypt tried to weaken her, tried to break her, and where many would have quite easily taken a brown envelope and looked the other way. She remained strong and she held onto the rope so tight her knuckles must have been white. Every time they made an offer, she rejected it. Her followers knew this and they become greater in number and stronger in belief. And due to the oppression of the government, Many of them were imprisoned too. Mariam is right. They're not just going to stop at coming after one person. They are going to come after as many as they can. But how will you react? What will you say when you get, or if you get, that knock on the door? The rulers of Nasser's time, they feared her influence would make people overpower the government. So the services would falsely accuse her of plotting against the Egyptian president. They needed to get rid of her. Her house was raided, her property confiscated, and she was taken to prison. The, the, she was taken to prison in 1965 and the court case was in 1966. And for seven years, she fear, faced the, the severest forms of torture. I can't go into detail in this room tonight about those forms of torture and abuse. It is outlined in her book, but the details are simply too pornographic, too gross, and even in your wildest imagination, you could not conjure up what she endured. Had she not had the courage to write what happened in her own words, I would not have believed it. But I will recount one episode which happened in a room called Room 24. And these are in her own words. The room was full of dogs. I could not count how many. Scared, 
I closed my eyes and put my hands to my chest. Within seconds, the snarling dogs were all over me and I could feel their teeth tearing into every part of my body. Clenching my hands tight into my armpits, I began to recount the names of Allah, beginning with, O oh Allah, O oh Allah. The dogs were unrelenting, digging their teeth into my scalp, my shoulders, back, chest, and wherever they had not already taken hold. I repeatedly invoked my Lord, calling, O oh Lord, make me not distracted by anything except you. Let all my attention be for you alone. You, my Lord, the one, the only, the unique, the eternal, absolute. Take me from the world of forms. Distract me from all this phenomena. Let my whole attention be for you. Make me stand in your presence. Bestow on me your tranquility. Clothe me with the garments of your love. Provide me with death for your sake, loving for your sake, contentment with you, O Lord. Hold the steps of the faithful firm. Imagine these are her words when she's in a room full of dogs that are ripping at her, snarling and biting. She goes on. I repeated this inwardly for what seemed like several hours until at last the door was opened. The dogs forced from my body and I was taken out. I expected that my clothes would be thoroughly stained with blood for I was sure the dogs had bitten every part of my body. But incredulously, there was not a single blood stain on my clothes as if the dogs had been in my imagination only. May God be exalted, he is with me. I began questioning inwardly whether I deserved all these bounties and gifts from Allah. My warders could not believe it either. I glimpsed the sky outside, filled with the evening twilight, indicating sunset. I concluded that I must have been locked in with the dogs for more than three hours. Praise be to God for any adversity. We are in Ramadan, so I will finish with one more story that I think is, is quite appropriate, and it's a tale that she recounts about one of four visions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that she would see during her time in prison. In her own words, there in front of me, praise be to Allah, was a vast desert and camels with camel carrier seats as if made of light. On each howder were four men, all with luminous faces. I found myself behind this huge train of camels in that vast, endless desert and standing behind a great, reverend man. This man was holding a halter which passed through the neck of each camel. I wondered silently, could this man be the prophet, peace be upon him? Silence has no safeguard with the prophet who replied, Zainab, you are following in the footsteps of Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger. Am I master? following in the footsteps of Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger. You, Zainab Ghazali, are following in the footsteps of Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger. O oh, my beloved, am I truly following in your footsteps? Zainab, you are on the right path. You are on the right path, Zainab. You are following in the footsteps of Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger. Twice more, I repeated my question, receiving the same response from the Prophet, Salah alaihi I woke up feeling I owned the world, astonished I had forgotten my whereabouts and what I was facing. Nor did I feel any pain, nor see the wooden post near the window. 
It seemed that I had been taken to another place where voices came from afar. Furthermore, I was astonished, for although I am known as Zainab al-Ghazali, my recorded name at birth was Zainab Ghazali, and it was by this name that the Prophet had called me. Indeed, the vision had transported me beyond time and space. I did tayammum and began praying, thanking Allah for his gift. In one of my prostrations, I found myself invoking, Lord, by what means am I going to thank you? This is a woman who was enduring torture daily and see how tight she is holding on to the rope of Allah. Lord, by what means am I going to thank you? There is nothing I can thank you with except by renewing my allegiance to you. O oh Allah, I pledge allegiance to die for your sake, O oh Allah. I pledge allegiance to you that none should be tortured because of me. O oh Allah, hold me firm in following the truth that you are pleased with and confine me within the limits of right that pleases you. Tranquility and peace of mind were mine. An incredible woman whose reputation, whose words, whose thoughts and deeds will live on. She is an inspiration to all of us, brothers and sisters alike. Thank you for allowing me to share her words. Salam alaikum.